priorities for 2014. Jesus talking here in verse 19, he says, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moth and rust do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. Look at verse 24. No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Therefore, I tell you, don't worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Isn't life more important than food and your body more important than clothes? Jump down to verse 31 and let's finish the words of Jesus here in Matthew 6. So don't worry saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the pagans chase after these things and your heavenly father knows that you need them. Let's say these words of Jesus together now in Matthew 6, 33. I think you know them. Some of his most familiar words. Jesus says, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this first Sunday of this new year, 2014. And we thank you, Lord, that this is a year full of hope and promise. Lord, because we have you in the center of our lives, I pray as we share your word this morning that you'd speak to our hearts about priorities in 2014. In Jesus' name, everyone said, amen. amen. I want to tell you 2014 is going to be the best year yet at Harvest Time Church. As we begin this new year, I want to ask you to just be in earnest prayer with us. Uh, out of the blue on Thursday, the 2nd of January, first work day of the new year, uh, I received word of two potential miracles on the horizon for our church. One of them has to do with our Stanford Satellite Campus. The other has to do with our Phase 2 building. And I want to tell you, God is on the move from the very first workday of the new year. And so I want you to be in earnest prayer with us that God is going to do great things. I've been waiting to bring you a report about the Jump In Capital campaign. We continued receiving commitments for the campaign all through the month of December, right up even on December 31st. We still received commitment cards, and people have been giving generously to the campaign already. And I'm excited to share with you that by far, this has been the largest campaign that we've ever done in terms of participation. And there's kind of a funny double-double thing going on here. Uh, you know, phase two is exactly double the size of phase one. And we received exactly double the number of commitments for phase two as we received for phase one. And it was exactly double the amount. In 2000, we pledged $1.5 million uh, for the construction of this building. And so far, our phase two pledges are $3 million. And I want to give thanks to the Lord because that is a good start. If you were with us over the holidays, we were absolutely jam-packed on Christmas Eve. We were jam-packed again on New Year's Eve. In fact, we had to turn people away at the doors on both Christmas Eve and New Year's Eve. I want to tell you that we need phase two now. You know, we could already fill up every one of the thousand seats in the sanctuary. We could fill up every classroom and every new office. In fact, one service on Sunday morning wouldn't be enough in our new building. And so, by God's grace, we are going to start this year. And there are three things at the very start of 2014 that I want to ask of you. First of all, I want to ask you to pray, 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 pray with us. We have a lot to do to get in position to actually break ground on the building. Uh, we filed for building permits with the town of Greenwich late last summer. It's a very long process. Uh, it takes quite a bit of time to get the actual building permit, and so we need your prayer. Secondly, I want to ask you, give as much as you can towards your pledge as soon as you can. Uh, 
My wife and I uh, made a faith commitment to jump in. That represents a sacrifice for our family, a stretch. Um, there's got to be a few miracles involved. But the first two checks that I wrote in 2014 uh, were, first of all, for our ties for the month of January. And the second check was our first gift towards our pledge to jump in. And we want to ask you to do the same as early as you can. Would you start giving towards your pledge? And the third thing is, if you haven't jumped in with us on phase two, there's no better time to do that than at the start of this new year. There are commitment cards out on the Welcome Center. There are envelopes. You can take those, pray about it, and get your commitment back to our office and jump in with us. So let's look at Matthew 6 now, and let's talk about priorities for 2014. Jesus is talking about priorities here, and he concludes with his most famous words perhaps of all, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and God will give you everything else that you need. To seek first the kingdom of God means to prioritize Jesus' leadership in my life. To seek first his righteousness means to prioritize Christ's likeness in my life. And on this first worship service of 2014, I believe that the Holy Spirit wants to speak a word to us about our priorities in 2014. As I look at Jesus' words here in Matthew 6, I find three priorities, and I want to share them with you quickly. Three truths on priorities. The first truth I find is about people. Truth about people. Jesus says, everyone is. Would you say those words with me this morning? Everyone is is. There are four things Jesus says everyone is. First of all, Jesus says everyone is a saver. Jesus said, stop storing up for yourselves earthly treasures. Instead, store up eternal treasures. Let's take a quick little poll here on Sunday morning. I'm, I wonder how many of you would say that you are a saver that you like to save things, that you, you never know when you might need something, uh, you know, so you just put it away. How many of you are savers? Come on, let me see. Your hands are just barely little going up. Come on, some of you pack rats. I know you are a little bit. All right, how many of you are throwers? You say, I'm a thrower. I love to purge. I love to get rid of things. If, if I haven't used it in a day or two, it's out of here. Early on in our marriage, Denise tended to be more of a saver, and I tended to be more of a thrower. Now, I have to tell you, uh, this is in good conscience, I have to tell you that we have reverse roles, and now I'm the sentimental nut that wants to hold on to everything. But early on, she, she tended to be more of a saver. And I remember on our first anniversary, we were packing boxes to move here to Greenwich, and I came across a, a whole box full of scrap paper. Now, my wife is a printer's daughter, so for a printer, paper is gold. Paper is overhead. Paper, you know, cuts into your profit margin, and so the worst thing you can do is throw away paper. And so I found this whole box full of scrap paper, and I said to Denise, I said, I am not dragging that box of paper halfway across the country. And she said, oh, yes, you are. <laughs> Seven years later. I was in the basement of our second house here in Greenwich, and I found that stupid box of paper, and I finally threw it away. <laughs> but Jesus says everyone is a saver. Everyone is storing up something with his life. Everyone is accumulating something, collecting something. Some people, most I guess, are storing up earthly treasures, but a few are storing up eternal treasures. The question is not, am I accumulating something? You are. The real question is, what am I accumulating? By the investment of my time, by my pursuits, by my worship or my lack of worship, by my participation in the body of Christ or my lack of participation, what is it that I'm accumulating? Our twins turned 12 years old today. Today's their birthday. I can't believe that it is going so fast. My son asked me for a birthday present just at the start of service. He said, Dad, please don't tell everybody it's my birthday. So embarrass him real good if you see him in the hallway. But in first grade, they had a teacher that challenged them to start collections. And so Ben decided he was going to collect bottle caps. And Maddie decided she was going to collect rocks. 
Only they didn't know anything at all about collecting. So Ben didn't have any rare bottle caps from vintage beers or exotic brands. He collected the white plastic bottle caps off of Poland spring water bottles. And Maddie didn't collect rocks that were rare or beautiful. She picked up little pebbles out of the parking lot and off the grass. And I, everywhere I went, I would find these little stashes of rocks. You know, I'd open my car door, and in the pocket of the car door was a little pile of rocks. I'd pull open a, a drawer, and there was a little stash of rocks. They were avid collectors of things that were common. They didn't even realize that their collections were neither rare nor beautiful nor valuable. But the Bible says that a lot of us devote our lives to the same kind of collections. Paul said in the end when we meet the Lord, our collections are going to be tested by fire and some will be found to be gold and silver and precious stones and some will be found to be wood and hay and stubble. Everyone is a saver. The question is, what kind of saver am I? Not only is everyone a saver, but Jesus said everyone is a spotter. Everyone is a spotter. Jesus said if your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. The meaning of that word good is focused. Everyone is a spotter. Everyone has his eye focused on something. There are all kinds of spotters in the world. There are recreational spotters. They like to go out and sit at the end of a runway and spot airplanes. Uh, some sit by a train depot and they spot different types of trains or they sit in the woods and look at different kinds of birds and they photograph them and they log them. Can I tell you the last thing that I would ever want to do with my time is sit around watching airplanes fly in and out of an airport. I live just down the street here and I see hundreds of airplanes flying in and out every day and I wish I didn't have to see one. There are military spotters, and their job is to spot a target and keep their eye on it. A, a sniper team is made up of a shooter and a spotter, and so the spotter, his job is to find the desired object and to keep his eye on it until it's captured. In the same way, Jesus said everyone is a spotter. Listen to us. Every one of, us, uh, every one of our eyes is connected directly to our hearts. And whatever is the object of our heart's desire, our eye searches it out and it focuses on it until it's captured. The question is not, am I a spotter? The question is, what kind of spotter am I? What is it that you focus on? What captures your imagination? What captivates your heart? Everyone is a saver. Everyone is a spotter. Third, Jesus says here that everyone is a servant. Everyone is a servant. Jesus said, no man can serve two masters. He'll be devoted to the one and he'll neglect the other. Actually, I softened it a little bit because the word that Jesus really uses here is the word slave. And what he's telling me is that either I am his servant or I am a slave to the God of this world. The question is not, am I a slave? The real question is, to whom am I a servant or a slave? The great theologian Bob Dylan put it this way, you're going to have to serve somebody. It might be the devil or it might be the Lord, but you're going to have to serve somebody. Everyone is. A fourth thing that Jesus says everyone is, everyone is a seeker. Everyone is a seeker. Jesus said the pagans seek after food and drink and clothes. They frantically chase after these things, but you... Seek first the leadership and the likeness of Christ. Beloved, everyone is seeking. Everyone is seeking out something to pour his life into. Everyone is seeking out something to pour his energy to. So everyone is seeking out something with meaning and purpose. The question is not, am I a seeker? The real question is, what is it that I'm seeking? Two treasures, two eye conditions, two masters, Two ambitions of the heart, earthly treasure or eternal treasure. What will be your priority in 2014? Three truths on priorities. Truth about people. And secondly, I find here truth about earthly treasures. Truth about earthly treasures. What are earthly treasures that Jesus is talking about here? 
Well, earthly treasures are anything that belong to this life that I put ahead of Jesus. Earthly treasure might be any one part of life here on earth or all of it together. For some, earthly treasure is men's applause. You know, this is what the Pharisees loved and what Jesus addresses in the first half of Matthew 6. Their earthly treasure was the admiration of men. And for some, that's their earthly treasure too, to be respected, to be esteemed, to be regarded, to be envied for my intelligence, for my wit, for my talents and abilities, for my strength and my physique. For some, earthly treasure is their accomplishments, professional success or business success or personal success. For some, earthly treasure is their children's accomplishments. Beloved, can I tell you something? I really don't understand Christian parents who have a greater desire to see their children become good citizens of the world rather than be good citizens of the kingdom of heaven. I really don't understand Christian parents who put their kids' education and participation in sports and learning music and cultural experiences ahead of participation in the life of the church. Listen, if you want your kids to be successful, if you want them to be prosperous, if you want them to be happy and to live at peace, teach them to love Jesus first. And God will give them everything else that they need. God will open up every other door that they need. Godliness is more valuable for your kids in this life and in the next life than anything else that you could give them. That's good preaching right there. For some earthly treasures to become an aficionado of one kind or another, a cigar aficionado, a wine aficionado, food, fashion, art. How about making a goal of becoming a Jesus aficionado? How about making a goal of being a connoisseur of his presence, a specialist in the gifts of the Holy Spirit, an expert in his word. You know, you might have made New Year's resolutions. They might center around uh, relationships. They might center around physical goals. They might center around financial goals. Those things are all good. They're all worthy. They're all noble. But, but how about the New Year's resolution of, I'm going to be closer to Jesus in 2014. I'm going to grow in my relationship with him. Uh, I'm going to grow in Christ-likeness. I'm going to grow in the knowledge of his word. I'm going to be a more effective instrument for him everywhere I go, a, a more effective mouthpiece. How about setting the goal, Lord, I want to lay hands on someone and say, in the name of Jesus, be well and see them be healed, be whole. How about that kind of a goal for the new year? For some earthly treasures, they're acquaintances. Beloved, this is a hard truth, but even the desire for a good thing can become a bad thing if you put it ahead of Jesus. The Bible says he who finds a wife finds a good thing, but our desire for a spouse can become an earthly treasure. Our kids can become an earthly treasure. Friends, you know, Jesus doesn't allow anyone or anything to be first in my heart ahead of him, not even my family. Jesus said in Matthew 10, 37, these are hard words, anyone who loves his father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves his son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Jesus said our decision to follow him with our whole heart might cause conflict in our family relationships, but he said, put me first anyway. For some earthly treasure is amusements, movies, television, sports, music, clubbing, dancing, drinking, sexual conquest, eating, shopping, travel, good times, laughs, memory making. And for some, earthly treasure is clearly acquisitions, monetary and material accumulations. Earthly treasure could be any one of a number of things, and Jesus certainly has that in mind, but let's be frank. A lot of us love money and the things that it can buy. 
I fly to Malaysia once a year. Uh, it's about a 27-hour journey from door to door, from uh, our house to the speaker's apartment in Kuala Lumpur. And every time I get on the flight to uh, at JFK from New York to Hong Kong, which is about 16 and a half hours, and I walk past the big pods in first class on my way back to coach, I always say, Lord, I know money isn't everything, but it sure makes life a lot easier. A lot of us love the creature comforts and the cars and the clothes and the champagne and the caviar and the neat toys that money buys. Whatever your earthly treasures might be, Jesus said, don't waste your life trying to accumulate them. Here's why. For one thing, earthly treasures will always disappoint my heart. Jesus said, stop hoarding earthly treasures for yourselves because moth and rust destroy them and thieves break in and steal. In the end, earthly treasures will leave me empty handed. You see, they don't hold their value and I can't hold on to them forever. In Jesus' day, securities weren't very secure. Securities and valuables were highly vulnerable to depreciation and seizure. And it's still true today. Earthly treasure isn't very secure at all, whether it's money or whether it's something else. In the end, earthly treasure will leave me empty-handed, and I'm going to leave the earth empty-handed. You know, Job said, naked I came into this world, and naked I'm going to leave it. There was a man who received news that he only had a very short time to live. And so he called together his pastor and his doctor and his lawyer. And he said, I have been told over and over and over again that you can't take it with you. But he said, I'm going to prove them wrong. He gave each of the men an envelope with $300,000 in it. And he gave these instructions. He said, at my funeral, just before they close the casket and seal it and bury me, I want each of you to put this envelope in the casket. The day of the funeral came, and before they closed the casket, each one of the three men dutifully put his envelope in, and they sealed the lid, and they buried the casket, and then the three men went out to lunch. Beloved, no matter who you are, after your funeral, they're going to go out and eat lunch. <laughs> At lunch, the pastor was overcome with conviction. And he confessed to the other two men. He said, you know, the church needed money. So he said, I took $100,000 out of the envelope and I put the rest in. The doctor's face immediately turned bright red. And he said, well, since I'm with my pastor and my lawyer, I'm safe to confess. I'm building a new clinic. And he said, I took $200,000 out of my envelope and I put the rest in. The lawyer frowned at both men disapprovingly and he began to scold them. He said, gentlemen, I am ashamed of you. He said, I deposited the cash in my account and I put in a check for the entire amount. You can't take it with you. <laughs> Earthly treasures, they'll disappoint your heart. They'll distort your vision. Jesus said, if your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. Light and eyesight and the scripture are metaphors for wisdom and understanding and for guidance for life. To have a single eye means to focus sharply on one thing, to be devoted to one thing. And when my focus is earthly treasures, it distorts my vision. You know, that's the message of the parable of the sower. Earthly treasures and cares were the thorns that choked out the good seed of salvation. And earthly treasures and cares, they choke out my love for the word of God. They choke out my spiritual enthusiasm and joy. They choke out my spiritual life. They prevent me from bearing fruit. Earthly treasures and cares distract me from the presence of Jesus. They pull me away from him. That's what Jesus told Martha. You remember Mary was sitting at the feet of Jesus, but Martha was concerned about many earthly things. She was preoccupied, and it prevented her from enjoying Jesus. Beloved, let me tell you, the best part of the Christian life is enjoying Jesus. 
If you want to know what the best part of the Christian life is, it's what happens when we gather together here, sometimes for special services in the evening, and the presence of the Lord is so sweet among us, and you can just feel his presence. That's the best part. The best. This is the best part. It's coming together for worship and experiencing God and feeling his touch and, and earthly cares. They choke that out. They preoccupy me. They pull me away from that. Earthly treasures and cares cause me to overlook opportunities to invest in the kingdom of heaven. Jesus told a story about a rich man and a poor beggar named Lazarus. The rich man was consumed with his consuming. And he didn't realize that at his own gate there was an opportunity to invest in the kingdom of heaven. God laid at his feet an opportunity to give, to help the needy, but that man missed it. Beloved, can I tell you that I am never ashamed to talk to you about giving to the kingdom of God. I'm never ashamed to commend tithing to you. I'm never ashamed to commend giving to missions over and above your tithe. I'm never ashamed to ask you to sacrifice to help us build phase two. Sometimes I preach on giving and people will say to me, Pastor, I know that was a hard sermon. I got to tell you, it wasn't hard at all. Because first of all, I believe that our giving is God's pathway to earthly blessing. But more importantly than that, whenever you and I give to the kingdom of God, we are laying up treasure in heaven. Years ago, I went to a pastor's meeting. I was just starting out in ministry, and the man speaking was a man named Dan Betzer. And when he got up, this was his opening line. He said, when your people get to heaven, they will thank you for every opportunity you ever gave for them to give to the kingdom of God. And beloved, I want to tell you that is so true. You will not be sorry. You won't be sorry. We, we took an offering the Sunday before Christmas for our friend Jackson Sinyanga. We raised over $15,000 to buy desks and chairs for orphans uh, at the school in Uganda. You won't be sorry you gave. You won't be sorry that you gave to support our missionaries, to help our friend Pastor Raymond Mui. You won't be sorry that you gave to help build phase two, to buy some bricks and to pay for some steel and for some cement. You won't be sorry because when you get to heaven, every opportunity you took to give, God will reward you. Yeah. Earthly treasures, they disappoint my heart, they distort my vision, they dominate my will. Jesus said, you can't serve two masters. You can't serve God and mammon. The Aramaic word mammon literally means that in which I put my trust. It was a Chaldean god of wealth and prosperity. And it is impossible to devote myself to the things of God and to love the things of this life at the same time. Jesus said, God will be the loser every time. A man can work for two employers, but a slave can never belong to two owners. The very essence of slavery is that your entire person is owned. There's an irony about wealth in these words of Jesus. Jesus says, if you love owning it, it will end up owning you. It will dominate your will. That was the case of the rich young ruler. He sought out Jesus. He pursued Jesus. He so wanted to be close to Jesus. But Jesus knew that there was something else that had a hold on him. He was very wealthy and he loved his money. And when it came down to making a choice between God or his wealth, the rich young ruler couldn't escape the grip of his own riches. Earthly treasures disappoint my heart, distort my vision, dominate my will, and they distress my soul. Jesus said earthly treasures cause anxiety and they cause hoarding. I recently read about a woman who died in West Palm Beach, Florida. Her name was Bertha Adams. She was all alone in her apartment when she died of malnutrition. When they discovered her, she had dwindled down to just 55 pounds. And among her things, they found the keys to two safety deposit boxes. When they opened the boxes, they discovered in one hundreds of stocks and bonds and notes and cash in the amount of $200,000. When they opened the other safety deposit box, they found just cash, $600,000 worth of cash. 
Bertha Adams was a millionaire a few times over again, but her neighbors recalled that she was always begging from door to door, asking for food. See, driven by an irrational fear, she hoarded and hoarded and hoarded her money while her life ebbed away. And that's true of all earthly treasure. It distresses my soul because no matter how much I acquire, it, it will never be enough. I will never feel satisfied. I will never fear secure. The only real security that we have here on earth is the security that we have in Jesus. Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord watches the city, the watchmen stand guard in vain. Three truths about priorities in Matthew 6. Truth about people, truth about earthly treasure, and finally, I find truth here about eternal treasure. Truth about eternal treasure. Pastor Jason, you can come and help me. Jesus said, stop hoarding earthly treasures for yourself. Instead, store up treasures in heaven. What are these eternal treasures? Eternal treasure is anything I do in this life that accumulates in the next. What accumulates in heaven? The souls of redeemed men, people that I've shared Jesus with, that I've led into a relationship with him. My personal preparations for holiness accumulate in the next life. The prayers of the saints accumulate in the next life. Can I tell you the prayers that you're praying today, they are being saved in golden bowls in heaven. Listen, beloved, saints don't make intercession while they're in heaven. Saints make intercession while they're still alive on earth. And the intercession that you make while you're living here on earth, it gets stored up in golden bowls in heaven. And those prayers continue to have effect long after you prayed them. Even long after you've gone to heaven, those prayers you sowed, you invested while you were here are still having effect for your family, for your children, for your children's children, for the future generations uh, of your family and of his church. What accumulates in heaven tears of intercession. My worship accumulates in heaven. My service to Christ, good works that I have done out of a heart of love for Jesus. In the front half of Matthew 6, Jesus gives us some of the best ways to accumulate treasure in heaven, giving and praying and fasting. Now here's why eternal treasures are better than earthly treasures. Eternal treasures are better, first of all, because they raise expectations in my heart. I have an expectation that God is going to take care of me. I have an expectation that God is going to give me everything I need. I have an expectation that God has got my back, that he's watching me, that he's going to come through because I have taken those opportunities to sow. When your people get to heaven, they will thank you for every opportunity you gave them to give. Jesus says three times here in Matthew 6 about our giving, you will be rewarded, you will be rewarded, you will be rewarded. Hebrews says God is not unjust. He won't forget your work and the love that you've shown him as you've helped his people and as you continue to help them. I want to tell you in 2014, there is an expectation of reward in my life. There's an expectation of reward for our congregation. There's an expectation of reward when we get to heaven. I plan to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. I, I plan to be standing next to you when you hear the same words from Jesus Eternal treasure puts expectation in my heart. Eternal treasures are better because they enlarge my vision. When my eyes are focused on eternal treasures, I can see those opportunities to invest in the kingdom that others overlook. Paul wrote, don't be weary in well-doing, knowing that in due season we shall reap a harvest if we don't faint. Therefore, take every opportunity to do good, especially to those who belong to the household of faith. Beloved, listen to me. It does not say anywhere in Scripture. Give your kids every experience and every opportunity that presents itself. It doesn't say anywhere in Scripture. Take every opportunity to pamper yourself. 
doesn't say anywhere in scripture, take every opportunity to improve yourself, to be entertained, to relax, to go out and buy stuff. What it does say is take every opportunity to do good. When God wants to bless you, he gives you an opportunity to sow, to serve, to help, to give, to care for the poor, to care for the needy. And when your eyes are focused on eternal things, you're going to see those opportunities for the divine setups for blessing that they really are. Let me tell you, there's one reason, one among many reasons I know phase two is going to happen and God's going to help us start it this year. It's because time and again, we have taken those opportunities to serve and to sow. I want to tell somebody today that 2014 is a year of due season for our congregation and for our families. Eternal treasures are better because they engage my will. Earthly treasures dominate my will, but eternal treasures engage my will. They make me excited about doing God's will and being his partner on earth. Eternal treasures are better because they encourage my soul. Very quickly from the words of Jesus, eternal treasures remind me of a few things. They remind me that my life is so much bigger than just my life here on earth. Jesus said, isn't your life more important than food? Isn't your body more important than clothes? And the answer is yes, yes it is. My life was created for communion with my Father, God, the King of the universe. My body was designed for immortality and destined to rule and reign forever. Eternal treasures remind me that there is so much more to my life than the right now. Eternal treasures encourage my soul because they remind me that my Father cares about me much more than anything else on earth. Jesus says here in Matthew 6, look at the birds of the air, how your Father cares for them. Look at the lilies of the field, how your Father dresses them. Aren't you more important than the birds and the flowers? And the answer is yes, yes you are. Earthly treasures encourage my soul because they remind me that no amount of earthly treasure can prevent me from graduating to the next life when God calls for me. Jesus said, who, by worrying about earthly things, can add a single hour to his life? As you think about this coming new year, what will be your priorities in 2014? Two treasures, two eye conditions, two masters, two ambitions of the heart. What will you save in 2014? What will you spot in 2014? Whom will you serve in 2014? What will you seek in 2014? Stop hoarding for yourself earthly treasures. The pagans chase after these things, but you seek first Christ's leadership and his likeness and God will give you everything else you need. How many of you know that is a great promise for the start of this new year? Stand on your feet this morning, and would you give Jesus, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, a great big offering of praise in this place. Come on, let's give Jesus a big praise. Oh, we can do better than that. Let's give him a big praise in this place this morning. Hallelujah. 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 Come on, lift up your voice. Let's make a declaration. It's a new season. It's a new season. It's a new day. Fresh anointing. Slowing my way. It's a season of power and prosperity. It's a new season coming. Come on, would you lift up your voice? Would you sing that with us? It's a new season. It's a new day. Fresh anointing is flowing my way. It's a season of power and prosperity. It's a new season coming to me. Hallelujah. 
As our final act of worship this morning, we're going to share at the Lord's table. But just before we do that, I wonder if you just lift your face to heaven. Would you lift your hands to heaven? And I want to invite you right now. Would you just take one moment? It's the first Sunday of the new year. Would you just take one moment and talk to Jesus yourself? Would you just tell him, Jesus, I'm going to put you first this year. I'm going to put you. You might have made a resolution for physical fitness or for financial responsibility or for more time with your family. Those are all good. Those are all worthy. Those are all noble things. But how about making a commitment right now? Jesus, I I'm going to put you, the pursuit of you. I'm going to put the pursuit of your leadership in my life and your likeness in my life first. Jesus, you're going to be first. Uh, the first day of every week, I'm going to get up and I'm going to come to your house and I'm going to give you the glory that's due your name. I'm going to bring my offering of thanksgiving. I'm going to bring my tithe to you. I'm going to invest during the week in your word. I'm going to invest in my kids' participation in the body of Christ, in the church, in the family of God. Come on right now, just between you and the Lord, would you just talk to him right now and say, Jesus, seek you. You seek first. The pagans, they run after those other things things, but you seek first Christ's leadership and his likeness, and God will give you everything you need. Come on, would you talk to him right now? Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Lift up your hands. I just want to pray for you. Father, I thank you so much for these people that you love so much. Jesus, I thank you so much that we're in covenant relationship with you. I thank you so much for your covering. Lord, I want to take a moment and I want to say thank you for 2013. I want to thank you for sustaining us and bringing us through. I want to thank you for all the victories and all the advances. I want to thank you, Lord, for walking with us through the valleys and for causing growth in the difficult times. Father, as we look at 2014, we stand in front of you. And Lord, we present ourselves to you. Lord, we stand here today telling you that we want Jesus first, Lord, that we put you first in our lives. We put you first in our hearts. We put you first in our families, in our marriages, in our relationship with our kids, Lord. We're going to offer you the first of our time, Lord. We're going to offer you the first of our increase. We're going to offer you, Lord, the very best. And Father, I pray that 2014 would be a year, Lord, where God just releases everything that's needed, all the doors of opportunity, Lord. Father, uh, the, the things that that have stood in our way, the obstacles, the, the barricades. Father, I pray they would just fall down and move out of the way. Lord, I pray early in the new year, Father, that you would just cause new uh, opportunities to open up for your people. God, I pray, Lord, that you would just cause healing power to move through our bodies, Lord. I pray that you would just move in our marriages, in our, in our families, in our homes, Lord. Father, I pray that this would be a great year of growth. I pray that this would be a great year of getting closer closer to Jesus. I pray that this would be a great year of bearing spiritual fruit, and I pray as we abide in the vine, Jesus, Lord, that uh, our lives would just be fruitful on every front and in every area. Father, Lord, we just give this coming year to you. Lord, we pray that you would just be our first priority in everything this year, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Come on, sing it again. It's a new season. It's a new season. Come on, would you just give thanks to the Lord right now? Come on, would you thank him for all his faithfulness to you in 2013 and over these years of your life? He's been with you every step of the way. Would you just thank him for that and just thank him that he's going to be with you every step of the way in this new year? We thank you, O oh Lord. We praise you, O oh Lord. We worship you, Jesus. We love you, Lord God. Paul wrote to the believers at Corinth, I receive from the Lord. That which I pass on to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's give thanks for the body of our Lord. Father, we thank you that you so loved us, that you gave Jesus your only son. Thank you that his body was broken so that we might be made whole in every way. Whole in our innermost being. Whole in our spirit. Whole in our emotions. Whole in our thoughts. Whole in our decisions. Whole in our relationships. Whole in our souls. And whole in our physical bodies. 
Father, right now I pray while we receive this bread that you would release the grace of healing all over this room. Lord, your word says that healing is the children's bread. Father, I thank you that his body was broken so that we who were not a people could now become a people, the family of God, the body of Christ. I pray while we receive this bread that you would release among us the beautiful unity of the Holy Spirit in the bond of peace. I pray, Father, that you'd make us one, even as the Father and the Son are one, as we partake together of this one loaf, Jesus. If your heart agrees with that, just say with me, amen and amen. Let's receive the bread together. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Come on, church, would you love on him for just a minute? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We thank you, O oh Lord. We thank you, O oh Lord. Grace, 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 grace. Grace in this place, Lord. Grace in this place, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Paul continues in the same way after supper. Jesus took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me for whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's give thanks. Father, we thank you that we have been redeemed, not by perishable things like gold or silver, but by the precious blood of Jesus, the spotless Lamb of God. Though our sins were as scarlet, you've washed us whiter than snow. Thank you for your promise that if any of us sin, we have an advocate with you, Father Jesus, the righteous one. And if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just not only to forgive us of our sins, but to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Father, right now, by faith in the cross of Jesus Christ, we receive everything purchased for us on Calvary. If your heart agrees with that, just say amen and amen with me. Let's receive the cup together. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, O oh Lord. 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 Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Father, I pray right now in Jesus' name that you just strengthen your people in their innermost being with strength from the Holy Spirit. Strengthen our minds, Lord. Father, strengthen our resolve for the challenges to come in this new year. Let the strength of God, Lord, come minister to our physical being, Lord. Strengthen our relationships. Strengthen our marriages. Strengthen our parenting relationships with our kids, Lord. Strength, Lord, in every area of our life, Lord. Father, let Holy Spirit creativity flow on your people in the workplace, Lord. I pray, God, just beginning Monday morning, I pray something would be different, Lord, in our place of employment. Lord, I pray there would be a shift, there would be a move, Lord. I pray, God, that we would be positioned, Lord, to just seize uh, wonderful opportunities for promotion, advancement, for success, Lord. Bless all the work of our hands in 2014, Lord. Let everything that we put our hands to, Lord, bring a good result and bring a good return for the care of our families and for sharing with the work of God. Father, let your blessing just fall down on us. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. The ushers are coming, and they're going to pass a container down your row. You can put your empty communion cup in that container as it goes by you. Come on, sing it one more time. My chains are gone. My chains are gone. My chains are gone.